So our presenter today is Kirsten Conrad, and she's the extension agent for Arlington and the city of Alexandria. She's been the extension agent since 2007 um, for the last 13 years. And we're also joined today by um, Colleen Kennedy, who is one of our master gardeners from the class of 2017. And she will be facilitating the presentation and taking your questions um, from the chat box and um, directing them to Kirsten at appropriate times. So we hope you enjoy the presentation today. And um, Kirsten, I'm going to hand it over to you. Okay, thank you so much. Welcome to today's presentation on, on our virtual classroom. We've been going strong every Friday morning since the first week of April. And I'm very pleased to bring this installment to you today. Um, this, as, as Leslie said, it will be recorded and it will be available again next week after we put closed captions on it. So we have a lot of um, um, <laughs> uh, territory to cover today, but I wanna start out by saying that Virginia Cooperative Extension is the outreach from the state land grant colleges, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. And we have been in existence since the late 1800s and have been here for the purpose of bringing the research-based education from our state land grant colleges to the boondocks, in this case, Arlington and Alexandria. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about plant propagation and um, I'm sure that many of you have had some experience with plant propagation. So hopefully this will be some review, but we have lots of time to ask questions and I hope that you will um, find, come get what you came for. Today, um, we're talking about plant propagation, which is essentially the art and science of the multiplication of plants, um, the controlled increase in plant numbers, and the use of both sexual and asexual plant propagation means to create more plants. Um, when we talk about sexual propagation, we're talking about the creation of seeds, the whole flowering process from the fertilization of uh, the male and combination of gametes that produce a, a genetically new type of plant. Um, and of course, the creation of miniature plants that um, are um, uh, brand new. Um, asexual propagation is propagation by remote means, uh, by vegetative means. Um, this can be either natural or manipulated. And we can create, use some of our modern technology to create clones. Seed propagation, um, which all of us have, have observed many times in, in nature and perhaps even have engaged in as a practice in our, in our horticultural hobbies, requires no really specialized techniques. The picture shows an avocado seed um, that I stuck in some dirt um, after consuming the fruit part of it and it grew. Um, I, I still have it. I may ship it down to Florida and let my brother grow it. But um, it's, it's a beautiful plant to grow and uh, we may, may end up in my office for a while. Um, under proper conditions, um, these um, seeds can be stored. Seeds can be stored for a long time without losing the viability. And of course, the, there's the most efficient method of, of saving, um, you know, producing a new plant and then saving it for later on reproduction. Um, seeds are easily transported because of their lightweight and oftentimes they can be saved for a long time because they are protected inside the seed coats. If you are in the process of collecting seeds, there's more to it than um, just uh, buying seeds at the seed packets or getting it from your neighbors. You can save money this way by collecting your own seed and by doing your own um, sexual propagation manipulation, you can actually um, create um, um, varieties of your own creation that are not sold commercially. I had a neighbor in Indiana who was a, a hosta fanatic and he would very carefully cross his uh, flowers from different kinds of hostas, he recorded, took notes, and he would grow the seeds that were produced under controlled environment in his basement under grow lights all winter long and uh, would then save the one or two uh, uh, plants that resulted as showing any kind of promise. But if you're into seed saving, you want to make sure that what you're saving is common, um, self-pollinated, um, non-hybrid, uh, or purebred annual veggie seeds, okay? These, well, this is specifically about veggie seeds. And of course, I was talking about hosta. You can do this with any kind of plant that produces a flower and would cross it over. 
with vegetables, these kinds of seeds um, include um, open pollinated varieties like lettuce, peas, herbs, heirloom tomatoes, all of these you can save the seeds from very effectively. Remember that if you're growing seeds from hybrids, um, the seeds will not be true to type. And anybody who's ever had a tomato grow out of your compost bin knows what I'm talking about. The seed that grow from the, from the, um, from the uh, fruit that is produced by a hybrid plant will typically revert back to a smaller type of fruit. That doesn't mean they don't taste any, any, any less good, but they're not gonna be the same kind of fruit as the hybrid that you planted. Um, some of the reasons that we um, need to be careful about saving seed is that they aren't necessarily going to come true um, from the seed for shape, form, growth, habit, flower, forage color. And sometimes I get questions all the time. My, uh, my pink zinnias are now yellow. <laughs> now they're red or they're white. And sometimes they do crossbreed and they will come out a different color sometimes. Um, um, seeds do, um, some plants are, are not grown from seed because they will um, easily be reproduced in the same exact form that they were in before when they were first grown. Um, they will root easily. Some plants root, take a long time to root and others root very easily. I've grown lots of avocado seeds. Some of them never germinate, okay? But others do root easily. If I can grow a cutting, I know that I'm gonna have a plant that's exactly the same. Um, some plants need to be grafted onto certain rootstocks in order to gain certain soil or insect tolerance so that they can have the same kinds of benefits um, or improve benefits from the um, straight genus. And of course, you can get bigger plants more quickly if you do cuttings out rather than seed. One of the really cool things in the plant propagation uh, frontier is tissue culture. And, October Glory is a, uh, a maple tree. And landscapers who require vast quantities of the same kind of tree, um, which we'll talk about in just a second, um, will often buy them from a producer which is growing them from a tissue culture operation. That is essentially that, so that they can obtain 100 trees, for instance, that are from the same genetic stock that they know that will bloom at the same time, will change color at the same time all together and be the same color in the fall. October Glory is a fabulous fall colored tree that um, um, is in much demand. Of course, the planting of monoculture is never a good idea. And um, we, we, we uh, as, as responsible sustainable landscape managers, do not recommend planting 100 trees down both sides of a street, okay, because of many, many reasons. But October Glory uh, tissue culture is done like any other tissue culture experiment. They start with small undifferentiated tissue. It's treated with oxygens and other hormones that is then um, um, produces um, uh, plant tissue, which is separated and grown on. Very cool. So, um, if you're going to save seeds, save them from healthy plants uh, and fruit that is ideal. Uh, don't save them from diseased plants or fruit that is not going to be exactly what you want it to be when, you, when that seed grows. Um, you want to harvest the seed just before it is fully ripe um, so that you can um, um, uh, finish the ripening process under a controlled um, um, situation. You also don't want to pick it too early. Okay, so make sure that the flower and the seed pot are starting to dry out before you harvest it. The picture is of a cone flower, um, which is at almost just the right stage. It's got the flower petals are still attached, but they're drying out. And of course, these uh, seed pot is completely dry, indicating that the seeds inside are going to be mature. You want to store these in a plastic bag or even a paper bag so that the, fruit, the flower continues to dry out and eventually the seed will fall out of the flower head or you can actually physically tear apart the seed head to get the seed. Now, if you have a pulpy fruit like a tomato or something like that, you need to separate the seeds from the pulp and dry them before you store them. It's important to remember that, that seeds are living organisms, okay? They are simply containing uh, the germplasm that's going to grow into a new plant. 
um, and what you need to do is to um, to make sure that they don't die inside that seed. You can save it um, in a Ziploc baggie, but you're going to have to open that up once in a while to allow air to come in. You can use an airtight cap on a jar, and the air tightness is important to control the humidity. You don't want them to get too wet. You don't want them to. Um, you you want them not to dry out either. So allow air to come into the into your seed storage once in a while, or or store them in a paper bag or a place like you know where the temperatures don't fluctuate, and they don't fall any lower than 40 degrees. Now, standard wisdom. Um, that seed life is one to five years, depending on species, is a good general rule of thumb. But um, if you, if you um, all know, you can save seed for, some kinds of seeds can be saved for a very long time. A couple of years ago, we planted, we found a bag of 10-year-old mustard green seeds. And we said, oh, what the heck? We planted that out. Every single one of them germinated. So we had no problem with that. Um, but but by seed viability, um, will become less and less over time if you store it under poor conditions. Seed in order to germinate sometimes requires some, um, some action. And this is because um, the, the seed coat is designed, it's by nature, to prevent the seed from germinating under adverse conditions. For instance, there's two processes that would be scarification and stratification, which are sometimes um, 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 used by seed, by plant growers to overcome seed dormancy. With scarification, you are altering the seed coat in some way um, to increase the ability of water and air to enter the seed. Each water and air are needed to be able to get the seed to begin the process of cell differentiation and growth. Um, scarification um, can be as simple as, as a physical manipulation of the seed. You can actually make a little hole in the seed with a file or nail clippers. And this is particularly useful for seeds that are heavy, uh, have very heavy seed coats. Some of the tree seeds um, will be uh, will be the germination will be sped up if you can physically alter the seed coat this way. Um, you can use um, um, hot temperatures to help break down the seed coat, and in some cases, a chemical acid wash bath is used in commercial seed propagation to um, to to scarify the seed coat. Stratification, on the other hand, is simply um, overcoming the seed dormancy res um, um, restrictions, I suppose, um, by more, by less drastic means, okay? Um, many, most seeds have some form of stratification that is required in order for them to germinate. For instance, it can be as simple as meeting the chilling requirements, all right? Seed, apple seeds, for instance, will not germinate until they have had a certain number of hours of 40 degree temperatures, okay? Put them in your refrigerator, okay? Alternating cool and warm temperatures helps fool the seed into thinking that um, it is time to, to, be, to grow. So um, stratification um, is why winter sowing works. Winter sowing, which is what the picture is, in the, is showing here, is, and by the way, the picture is at the Farrington Community Center, uh, in the back of the gardens. Uh, winter sowing is done in those, um, those containers, those milk jugs, um, and it can be done in, in any kind of container that you put some soil on the bottom, it has drainage. You spread your seed of your, basically your hardy perennials on top of that um, um, jug, on top of the soil, mix it in, and you set it outside for the winter time. It is in some ways no different from putting the seed on the ground. It will germinate in the spring, but by putting it in this controlled environment, the um, seed will germinate when it's ready, when it has overcome that stratification requirement and it has broken down um, the seed coat to the point where it is ready to grow. It is also going to germinate when it is ready. And you then have the seedlings in a controlled environment where they don't have to fight off other plants and you can transplant them. 
If there are any questions right now, I can stop and answer them, Colleen. There are a couple of questions, Kirsten. Someone asked, um, how do you store seed potatoes? How do you store seed potatoes? Yes. Um, seed potatoes should be stored in such a way that they won't rot. That's the primary primary um, um, obligation. Um, you need to store them in a dry, cool place. I would put them in a crate or even a single layer if you don't have so many um, and put them under some form of refrigeration where the um, um, humidity can be controlled. Okay. Um, there was a question. Uh, Mother Nature doesn't have scarification in her uh, toolbox. How does Mother Nature deal with the seeds that have these hard coats? Um, scarification um, is really interesting because in some cases um, it, it involves fire. You know, some, some trees like pinyon pines have to go through a fire before the seed coat um, is broken down enough to take in the water and oxygen that it needs to germinate. Um, some seeds require the passage through an animal's gut or even a bird's gut to be broken down by the, um, the acid which is in the digestive fluids before uh, and then excreted in a new location. In fact, this is a means of dissemination of seed um, for some species. Yeah. Okay. Um, is soaking a stratification method? I'm sorry, is what a stratification method? Soaking the seed? Um, yes, it is. Um, it, it, it is a way to, to um, force the, the, the seed to imbibe um, soak in water, and that process can be enhanced on seeds that are, um, have a very thick, hard seed coat by simply taking a file and weakening the seed coat by rubbing the, a hole in that seed coat. Yeah, yeah, I do that with nasturtiums. Um, when should you start stratification? Does it depend on the time of year or the temperature? Um, <laughs> it, a lot depends on how, what the facilities you have to grow your plants, all right? If you're doing, if you're not, if you're like the average grower and you simply have, um, you know, you're, grow, you're propagating seed to grow out in your garden, but you don't have a lot of indoor space or greenhouse space to grow them, you might simply try the winter sowing method because that means that they will come up, they will come up a little bit sooner than they would if you simply put them in the garden and you can protect them then and transplant them when they're ready. But if you don't have the means to, um, to, to grow the seedlings um, under some kind of protection in early spring uh, or even through the winter, I would simply um, allow nat natural stratification. Okay, that's it for questions. All right, great questions. All right. We're going to move on to asexual plant propagation now, which is essentially the use of vegetative organs, um, parts of the plants, to create a, a plant lad, a baby plant that is genetically identical to the parent. Uh, there's lots of reasons for this. Sometimes we want to clone desirable specimens. Sometimes your neighbor has come over and said, I want some of that plant. Uh, and you know that it's not going to come true from seed. So you can propagate those, um, those plants. Many of our tropical um, house plants um, are, are very easy to, to do asexual propagation with. Um, and of course, sometimes asexual propagation is done specifically to save a plant, um, to save a plant that is dying out um, or becoming extinct. We can also use um, cloning, if you will, um, to maintain genetic traits. So these are, these are all very valid reasons for doing that. One of the, um, um, diff the, there's incredibly different ways of doing um, asexual reproduction. Cuttings are the, uh, what we are all uh, involved with. Layering is sometimes done by mother nature. Um, and of course, division is a time-honored um, propagation skill practiced by many gardeners. We're not gonna talk about grafting and budding today in the interest of time but grafting and budding are also techniques for asexual reproduction that can save um, um, old fashioned valuable plants from, from extinction. Um, again, the styles or types of cuttings, um, the, 
one of my favorite pictures in propagation class is a stem of coleus. And some of you know coleus is a house plant. Um, you could take a stem cutting, a leaf cutting, you can take a leaf patio cutting, a leaf blade cutting, almost any piece of that plant you can take and produce a new plant from. We're also going to talk about cane cuttings and layering, and of course the use of rhizomes and stolons in cuttings for plant propagation. All of these pieces are, are parts of the plant anatomy, and um, when we talk about stem cutting in particular, we're talking about um, different kinds of, of, of wood. We have a little section later on where we talk more about um, woody plant cuttings, uh, but for this first section, we're gonna talk a lot about herbaceous um, cuttings. And of course, it helps to have some understanding of what the parts of the plant are that we're talking about. The node is where the leaf attaches to the stem. And this is often an area of great meristematic cell growth. And this is often where um, new root growth is initiated at the node of the, of the um, stem. In some plants, that new root initiation is done at the cambium level or at almost at any cutting point. Um, but for most plants, this is the, the node is where that, that cell differentiation is most readily taking place. Stem cutting is going to refer to any piece along the stem. And of course, the tip cutting, simply because of the, um, the, the way plants grow, is going to be most likely to be successful if you have a difficult to propagate plant. Um, the tip cutting has the most um, growth hormones, um, telling, sending signals to it to produce new leaves and will be most readily um, rootable. So in addition to using tip cuttings, uh, if you uh, want to be most successful, you need to be aware that um, you should not you should, that the growth you choose for cutting should be vegetative growth, not flowering growth. If a, if a stem is producing a flower, um, that energy is going into producing that flower. So try to pick a different piece of this plant that um, is, is only doing vegetative growth. Um, you need to know that new growth is going to be much more easy to root than old growth. Um, and this is because the stems, are, are, are the cells and the new growth are quickly multiplying and the old growth is going to take some, some additional coaxing along to be able to uh, produce um, cells, new, new, new roots. Plants should always be pest free, they should be disease free, and of course we want them to be turgid, which is a fancy word, but don't use limp or mortar material, okay? If, you're plant, if you've been cutting all day from your plant, if you've been pruning your shrubs and you just say, hey, I'm gonna try to root some of these. If you're gonna do that, stick them in the ground or stick them in your soil immediately after you cut. Don't wait until the end of the day to use those cuttings because once they, they limp, once they turn limp or once they wilt, um, you've lost some of that water in the cell and a, um, a, a layer of cells has formed at the cut that will inhibit the, um, the take up of water. The quality of cutting is also very important, as I mentioned. You want to make sure that the, um, that the cuts are clean, that they're not ragged, um, that you are maintaining the moisture. As soon as you make that cutting, stick it in a bucket of water, okay? And that's true of whether you're doing woody plants, woody plant cuttings or herbaceous plant cuttings. Stick them in a bucket of water, you can always come back and, and um, go through the rooting uh, the preparations. Ideally, we want to keep them cool, um, but above 40 degrees. Um, cool temperatures will, will start to slow down the process, but we also don't want them to sit out in the hot baking sun for a long time. For some, um, a quick trip through a 10%, uh, you know, a, a, a bath, a, chlor a chlorine bath will help. For some, the dusting with sulfur will help, but whatever you choose to do, if, if, you, if you do that sort of thing, you need to allow it to dry for a day before you, um, before you then, then um, stick it into the um, um, soil. This all works because of something called totipotency, okay? And totipotency is the, um, the tendency of a plant piece to produce new um, structures from undifferentiated cell structures. They can change, um, you know, a, a stem cell can change into roots um, 
with the proper encouragement. Codipotency talks about the amount, the ability of the plant to do this. And of course, some plants have very high totipotency and some plants have very low. But essentially, every cell in the plant has the necessary genetic information to produce a new plant organ. And that's why tissue culture does work. Here's um, an example of totipotency. On the left side, we have um, leaves from a, a cotton koi, a mother of millions plant. Um, typically, mother of millions plants, and you can see at the very top edge on the left side, these little, like, little tags on the leaf. That's the beginning of new little plantlets, which grow on the tips of the leaves. It's a very unusual um, means of propagation, which I will show you a picture of a little bit later. But I wanted to show you the beginning of the root formation on the stem, um, uh, leaf stem cuttings here, okay? Um, obviously, we have some which have very advanced um, root development, relatively advanced compared to others. But I know that if I left these in the water for a little bit longer, they would be, um, they would be, they would grow enough roots to be able to transplant. Truth to tell, this plant um, roots so readily, I could simply stick that leaf into a soil bath, into a soil container, and uh, it would grow quite well without having the water step. This is a, a picture of a, of, a, of a Christmas cactus, and the stem, this, this, um, the stem of the plant was, was attached to a much longer stem. It broke off, and I stuck it in the soil, and it grew. <coughs> I did not need to use this entire piece to be able to produce this root structure. I could have gotten this root structure simply by, um, by breaking off each one of these leaves and sticking the base of it in the soil. Obviously, I also have a much larger plant now to start with or to give to somebody else than I would if I started out with a single leaf. But if anybody who has these plants know, these leaves break off all the time, and they actually um, uh, will lay on the ground, and they will actually root. Sometimes it doesn't even take that. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but I have a piece here of Christmas cactus, and you can see the roots that are developing just from the nodes of the leaf in air. So this plant wants to grow, and it wants to produce um, new plantlets. If I broke these all off like this, they come with a piece of root attached to it, and you can simply stick that on soil and grow, have, grow a new plant. Cool, huh? Okay. So there's another type of cutting which is really fun, and it's called a split vein leaf cutting. And this is typically done on plants like begonias. And this is where you take a single leaf that has very prominent veins like a begonia, and you cut through those veins without destroying the leaf, and you simply pin it down to your rooting material and treat the cuts with a rooting hormone, all right? Eventually, those little cuts will produce a new plantlet at that location. Here's what it looks like. You can see the um, um, picture on the lower right, which is not real great, um, but that leaf has been sitting on top of um, um, planting medium and it's been sitting horizontally on that. Not only did the base of the leaf grow roots, but every cut in the vein that's shown at the top right also grew roots. And that's what these roots are down below the leaf in the person's hand here. You can also see on the top of the leaf a little tiny plantlet coming up there, which can be then separated from the whole leaf and repotted. Okay? This is a Rex begonia. You can try this with other plants, but it happens to work very well. We've done this in class, a master garden training class, um, almost every year for propagation class. You don't need to have the patio. You can remove that entire patio, and you can simply pin this down. What's really important is that the leaf wants to curl. It wants to um, um, come off contact with the soil. And so you're going to have to keep those cut surfaces in touch with the soil by using a hairpin or something else to push down um, around, a paper clip works really well. 
okay? Uh, push down from the top of the leaf to hold that cut surface against the um, um, potting mix, okay? But if you can do that long enough and maintain the humidity to prevent the cut from drying out badly, you will also have a new plant that you can propagate. Here's an example, another picture of this. And I, I focused on this because this people find this so cool. Now, now notice that they have, um, the picture on the right has, uses um, vermiculite um, as a rooting medium. Yes? Um, you, your, your mic went a little low and it's harder to hear you now. Okay, thank Very, you. Much better. Okay. Um, the vermiculite is a, is a well-drained, uh, well-drained, easy to drain material that is um, um, readily available and it works well. What you don't want to do is have a potting mix which is so heavy and wet that, it, um, that, the, that the leaf rots, okay? You also don't want it to dry out. So you need something that will retain moisture without, um, without becoming soppy. Very scientific word. Okay. Let's talk about this thing called a cane cutting. This is different back here. And um, I will tell you that these pictures come from cane cuttings that we did a year ago in Master Gardener class. Now these have had no special care, no fertilization. They were stuck into a, um, um, a tray of, of potting mix. They were put in the tray so that the top half of the cane was exposed to the, to the air and the bottom half was buried in the, in the rooting mix, okay? Um, eventually, um, buds formed and the roots continued to grow and now I have these beautiful plants. And of course, this was made necessary by the growth habit of different bacchia, which is, in this case, was huge. It was like three and a half feet tall and was leggy and falling over and now I have a beautiful little plant. So that's a very good reason to, um, to propagate and do cuttings from plants is to rejuvenate and to reduce the size of, of um, plants that have overgrown the space. Okay, this is very fun, very cool. Okay, I wanna talk about layering a little bit. And layering is something that happens naturally in nature, but you can help the process along. Um, layering is, is um, typically um, when a stem of the plant reaches out, it grows out, it arches over from the parent plant, um, touches the ground, and roots there where it touches. Um, raspberries and forsythias, um, uh, forsythias are two examples of plants that do this readily. And if you go out and inspect the forsythia plant, chances are you can actually see this happening where the total arching branches come out and down, it touches the ground and it roots right there where it touches, sends up a new, a new branch. And with the proper care, what the, the, tip, the trick is going to be to sever once that new growth starts and you, can, and you know that it's got roots and you can test that simply by pulling up the plant, tugging on the plant a little bit. Um, once it has roots, you can sever um, that connection to the parent plant and you will have a new plant to dig up and transplant. That's an example of simple uh, layering. Um, compound layering can be done with pothos, which, is, which I'll show you a picture of in just a second. Um, this is a common house plant vine. And of course, mound layering is where you would take a, a shrub like gooseberries or apple, and it's used to create rootstocks for apple trees a lot. And you would cut it off, you would mound soil over the top of that plant, of that stump, and the new shoots that are developed by the plant, by the original mother plant, the new shoots that develop will all be rooted in that mound. And you can separate them from the, um, from the parent plant. Air layering, I have some pictures for you that can be done on cane plants and can be done on different vacuia but it's really easy to do on plants like this one. This is Dracaena uh, marginata, um, big, ugly, you know, house plant um, when it's left to go, but you can do air layering on this and rubber plants uh, simply by putting a, uh, making a cut in the stem, not all the way through, make a cut in the stem, dust the surface of the cut with rooting hormone, get some sphagnum moss, stick it in there, around, uh, make a mound of it that's completely, completely saturated with water, 
uh, make sure that some of that spider moss goes into that cut. Now what I've done, I've also splinted the, um, the top and bottom stems so that they don't break off because that cut can weaken the connection and it will sometimes break off. But splint the, splint the stem, um, put the spider moss around that cut that you have stuffed with more spider moss after treating it with rooting hormone, wrap it with plastic nice and tight uh, top and bottom and then check it from time to time. You want to make sure that the spider moss never dries out and uh, you can do that simply by untying the top and sticking your finger down in there and seeing. Eventually you will see roots growing against the inside of the plastic and when that happens you know that you can sever the top of the plant below the rooting section, below the newly rooted piece there. You can sever the mother plant and stick that newly rooted top into a new pot. A lot of fun. Here's an example of, of vine laying or um, um, on pothos. This is, um, this is the, up the top left picture shows a vine that has been growing all summer on my patio right next to a planting bed. And everywhere it was touching the ground, it grew new roots. I could leave it in place, sever each one of these pieces right here, and I would have, oops, multiple plants to put in a pot. Instead, I cut off the entire vine back in here, curled it up in a circle, and stuck it in the top of the pot. I know that each one of those growing points that I cut off as part of the entire vine will continue to grow, and I will have a beautiful little plant here to give to somebody, okay? So this is um, um, a type of layering as well. Okay, division, division, crown division is what we all do with our perennial plants. Um, crown division um, um, works, especially in areas where our plants have gotten too crowded. This is a little piece of my back patio here um, with a very common um, one of the mill hosta plant growing next to a camisiparis, crowding it, cutting down the light there. So I dug out the plant next to the camisiparis and decided to propagate it for the purposes of this, um, of this, this demonstration. Um, the other type of division involves taking stolons and runners that we sort of just talked about with the layering, um, with the runners of the plant coming out from the pothos plant. Um, we can easily split um, the new plants from the parents. Offsets um, are plant, new plants that are grown next to the crown of a plant that we can separate. And of course, bulbs and combs have their own very um, special types of offsets that we can talk about. Um, there's me holding up my, my uh, hosta, my hosta clump that is too close to my camera zippers that I want to stop shading. And um, I dug that out with a shovel, a shovel, put it on a table and started to cut it apart. Any kind of knife, you can use a pitchfork, um, anything you can do to pull that crown apart. I continued to work on it until I had a number of different pieces. This is all from the same one clump right here. And ideally, uh, we would like to have for a nice plant next year, I would like to have three to five eyes and the eye will be a growing point. You can see right here, this is a growing point right here where a new, a new top growth will come out. My divisions ideally should have three to five eyes. Some of them have more than that. And of course, some of them have much less than that. But I wanna tell you, that little thing right there is going to grow into a new plant. It's just gonna take longer to do that. All right, I've got good roots on it. I've got a nice growing point here. But if you're, if you're propagating plants for a plant swap or a plant sale, go with the three to five eyes so that you have a soluble, beautiful, beautiful plant right away. <coughs> okay, here's Iris. Iris division is done in much the same way and it should be done. And I really want to put a little um, public service message here about plant division. Most perennials that, are, that produce the growing clumps 
will produce and produce and produce new growth and new eyes and new growing points to the point where they are crowding themselves out. This is an example of a plant that does that. And if you allow an iris clump to grow undivided for many years, you will find a, that the iris is only healthy near the outside perimeter of the clump. The inside perimeter basically chokes itself out. And in order to rejuvenate that clump, you need to dig the entire thing up, throw away the bad stuff in the center and divide the, the perimeter ring. New iris pieces um, can be propagated with only one eye. They should be planted, replanted again with the top of the rhizome sticking out of the surface of the ground. And one of the problems that people make when they replant iris divisions is that they plant them too deeply. And if you plant them too deeply, they will not bloom well. And you can see here, this is a good one to look at right here. It has the rhizome and then it has the, the growing point, and then it has the roots, okay? The rhizome needs to be on the surface, the roots are what can be down in the soil. Plant them in about a circle, you know, plant them about six inches apart, and you will have a beautiful clump of iris next year. Now notice that we have some that you can see the cut face, like this one right here. This is one that, um, when, after you divide them, they should be allowed to air dry um, for a couple of days before you replant them. Uh, and this is to allow time for these cells to develop a callus, uh, a callus tissue there, which will prevent infection. Many growers will dip these into an antifungal bath um, to prevent them from rotting. And of course, anytime you do cut into a plant like this, you do open a wound in which rot can get settled. So you want to try to avoid that. Kirsten, can I just interrupt for a second? There sure. were a couple of questions about what are eyes actually, and could you point them out? What do you mean by three to five eyes? Okay, the eye is referring to the growing point. Okay. Um, uh, most of us are familiar with a potato, for instance. A potato is a modified stem, and each one of those, those eyes on a potato is a place where potentially new growth could start, all right? An eye in the clump of hosta is all of these eyes. And when you, in the springtime, when they first come up, it's easy to see these because they will appear like little sword-like um, growing points. That is the eye, when we're talking about an eye in a hosta plant. Um, growing points, you know, you can, you can substitute that term for the for the word eyes that I'm using. But in, in iris, we don't want three to five growing points. We don't want three to five eyes. We just would need one. And of course, you can, you can dig a larger clump if you want to. But if you're propagating iris and for their own health, you should divide them this way and then plant three of them back again into a planting hole if you want a clump of iris to grow. They would do better that way and um, they, you know, they will have, um, um, if, the, if the rhizome is strong enough, it will produce a flower stalk in the first year from that cutting. Do you have time? We have a bunch of questions piling okay. up. <laughs> okay. Um, when you're taking cuttings and plunking them in water, do you add anything to the water? Um, good question. I do not add th anything to the water. Um, I think it's important to note that plants grown in water will produce roots that are sometimes referred to as water roots, okay, as opposed to roots that are grown in soil. Um, if you start a root in, a, a cutting in water and then subsequently plant those, that, those that, cut, that rooted cutting into soil, eventually those water roots will be replaced with a different kind of root that is more suitable for growing in the soil. Um, I'm not saying it's a bad thing and water roots can help a plant begin that process of transitioning to um, a soil environment, all right? 
but know that the soil, that the roots that are planted in water are not the same, that are produced in water are not the same as the roots that are going to be produced in soil. Thank you. A little bit related was a question on whether you could use a liquid hydroponic solution in this process. Um, a hydroponic solution um, um, can be very depending on what you wish to accomplish with it. Um, typically, the first thing that came into my mind was that uh, hydroponic solutions are usually for nutrient provision for the plants that are growing in them. Um, if, that, if that nutrient solution has um, hormone uh, growth, auxin type hormones added to it, yes, I suppose that that would enhance um, the development of, of roots. Okay. Um, can you propagate beauty berry by layering? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. And, and if you wish to do this to a plant that doesn't do it naturally, all you have to do is take a stem and bend it down to the ground and put a, you can make a little tiny cut or an abrasion on the bottom of the stem and then place a brick on top of that, um, that, that location so that that cut surface remains in contact with the soil. Okay, and you want to make sure that that, that contact is maintained throughout the rooting process. And sometimes it can take a long time um, I did that for an azalea um, for a, a, a woman who was moving. The azalea had been a gift from her mother many, many years ago. She was moving from her home, and she knew that she couldn't take the very large shrub with her. And so we, bent, we took the stems, bent them down, did the wounding, stuck a brick on top of it so that it would grow into the soil. And within... I don't know, it was done in the springtime. Within three months, we had a rooted cutting that we could take away from that plant. Excellent, okay. Another uh, guest commented that they had successfully grown a coleus from a cutting. It rooted over the winter, but the stems that were produced had no seed. Is, is that typical? Had no seed? Yeah, it wasn't producing any seeds. Um. Um, uh, the stem, the stem. I'm not. I'm not sure. I understand the question completely because, because essentially, what you're doing is you're growing a vegetative plant at the part, plant part. Um, and typically, the plants, uh, coleus, in order to produce seed, is going to have to flower, and it's going to have to, the flower is going to have to be fertilized. Okay, so um, um, I would I would venture to guess that it's not likely to produce seed in an indoor environment, if I'm understanding the question correctly, unless it gets very highly, um, um, high levels of light. Okay. Um, do tomatoes try to layer? Um, tomatoes, uh, you can do anything with tomatoes. You know, <laughs> some of you have grown tomatoes, you can, you'd notice that they actually grow stems, roots out of the stem of the plant. Um, and if you were to, um, to, 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 to take a cutting from that or, or even lay that stem down on the ground, you would, have, you would easily be able to root that. Um, I, I think that it would root better from the semi-hardwood, the, the older growth, than it would from the very newest, youngest growth. But it's worth trying uh, if you want to try that. Okay. Um, what is the best time of year for division? Um, division should be done, uh, well, let's talk about that in a minute. Um, if you do division in the springtime, when the clumps are first coming up, uh, you will have um, new plants that are produced from that that look like a nice plant, look like a normal plant. If you do division this time of year, you will end up with a, a you know, a ragged, bedraggled sort of looking um, um, top. And one of the reasons that we cut back the irises, for instance, in this picture, is that once, once you have separated them, the leaves are, are really, you should, this should be done, uh, the, the leaves need to be regenerated, okay? In the hosta case, you know, if you're doing a plant sale in the fall, the division should be done in July or something so that there's time for that to regrow into a pretty plant. And my advice for, in that case is that you want to cut off the old leaves so that you end up with new leaves being produced that are beautiful. 
Um, but if you do it in the springtime, that's going to be the best, um, the best time to regenerate most plants when they're actively grown. Okay. Um, how do you make an antifungal bath? Ah, antifungal bath. Well, um, the sulfur is one natural way to do it. Um, um, simply making a, a, um, a, a, a solution of bleach and water, a 10% bleach solution and dipping your plants in it, that will, that will help. Help with your tools too. Um, <laughs> you can also um, purchase um, um, uh, antifungal um, liquid uh, formulations that can be used as, as a dip. Also, many of the, um, the rooting hormones, the powders, actually have an, a fungicide that is part of the formulation of the, um, of the, rooting, horm the, the rooting hormone, the rooting powder. Okay, great. Um, is there a good way to propagate grasses? Grasses, um, yes. Um, the best, are, we, are we talking about ornamental grasses? I assume so. Okay. Um, Ornamental grasses are the most e the easiest, most effective way to, to is through clump division, and that's a real hard thing. If you have a really large clump, uh, it can be very hard to dig that out of the ground. Um, turf grasses are routinely um, divided, if you will, simply by taking plugs, and plugs just consist of taking a small piece of that turf grass and replanting that, you know, in a bare area. Um, sod. That's essentially what sod is. So if you're talking about ornamental grasses, you are going to divide that almost exactly the same way you would divide the hosta. You would dig up the entire clump, split it into pieces that have some, some root mass and three to five eyes at a minimum, and we plant that. Okay. How about coral bells? How would you divide and propagate them? Um, coral bells um, are not big are not often, um, in my experience, very big clump producers, but the best time to do that would be in the springtime when they first come up. And if your plant is dividable, and by that I mean does it have eight or 10 or 12 um, growing points that you can cut apart, um, then yes, that's when I would do it. Okay. How about uh, succulents? Can you propagate them? Do you have any recommendations? Um, yes, succulents, um, like the Christmas cactus, um, tend to be very, um, very easily um, um, reproducible. Some of the others, like Hayworthia, will produce an offset, which we're going to talk about, uh, how, how that happens. Um, aloe plant can easily be um, divided through offsets as well. Okay. So let's look at some of those. All righty. Um, one final question. Does air layering work with a ponytail plant? A ponytail plant. I've never heard of it being used on a ponytail plant. Okay. That's but it's worth a try. If your plant, ponytail plant has gotten ugly or has gotten, um, um, you know, um, run out of space for it, um, it's, it's worth a try rather than throwing it away. Okay, great. Thank you. That's it for the questions. Okay. So here's, um, let's talk about um, azalea layering. Um, this is on the upper left-hand picture. This is my azalea shrub in my backyard. And um, this is a, a, a plant that tends to produce lots of branches that will be eminently suitable for layering. You can bring one of those long branches down to the ground, allow it to touch on there, and it will grow roots. This particular plant had a piece growing, a branch, a low branch growing out towards um, where I'm standing here. Uh, and I looked at that one day and I was going to prune it away and I realized it was rooted in the ground right here. Okay, and this is not a real great picture, but this is my cutting shears right here. And this is the mother plant over here in this picture. And this is the piece coming out towards where I'm standing in this picture. I tugged on it, determined that it was rooted, severed the branch that connected it to the mother plant. And a, I don't know, a matter of a couple of weeks later, I, I came back and dug the entire piece out of the ground. Presto, I have a new plant. Okay, now, because it is rooted right here, close to where my air is showing right here, I could cut this back to that point and it would be, end up making a much more um, uh, beautiful plant eventually. But for this year, I'm just going to plant this entire clump and I will have a beautiful new plant. 
for to give away or, or, or to plant somewhere else. Okay, so that's an example of layering. Here's the Forsythia plant that I talked about earlier and the layering that happens there. This is an example of the stem um, where it has come down, it touches the ground, and it has started to grow a new root right there, what has been cut multiple times by weed whackers, um, but it is growing a new root right there. I could cultivate that, eventually cut that off from here and transplant it. This is a hydrangea plant right here that had an offset. And this offset was removed from the crown of the plant and put into a pot. And I've got a new hydrangea plant right here now, okay? Um, other plants that do this include witch hazel, uh, magnolia will do this. You can separate the crown away. Hollies are very easily done this way. Pyracanthus, spirea. Spirea will often produce a new plant from the base, just all away from the base of the mother plant. So try this. Okay, um, stems, rhizomes, and stolons. This is, uh, we're going to talk about root division now. Uh, and you need to know a little bit about um, plant anatomy. This is a, the division between rhizomes, um, which is a fleshy stem. And plants that have underground Fleshy stems include lily, canna lilies, um, iris, um, ginger, bamboo. Plant we love, would love to get rid of, right? Um, stolen is a, is a horizontal creeping stem. A stolen is above ground, a rhizome is below ground. And stolons are commonly produced by strawberries. All of us know how strawberries produce those runners. Um, at the end of, towards the middle of the first year. Um, a juga does this sometimes. And some woody shrubs will produce a horizontal creeping stem um, that will produce an offset that, that allows me to cut it away. Stem tubers and root tubers are often confused with each other. Uh, there's a big difference. Um, a stem tuber is one that has nodes and growing points or eyes on its structure. A root tuber that is expressed by something like a sweet potato or a dahlia is going to be a storage structure that only has one eye on it. It has a root system, it has the storage structure, which is the root tuber, and then it has one eye. Corms are, are also modified stems, um, and crocus and tuberous begonias are great examples of corms that have a, a base plate and it has, it is composed of a, a, a bulb-like structure, which consists of, of leaves and stems in, uh, in, in, in that bulb. Um, true bulbs, however, are layers of leaves that are surround, surround a flower bed. And some of these other, these um, um, common, common bulbs that we, we grow are considered to be bulbs as opposed to corn. Let's look at some of these more carefully. This is um, a juga on the top left. Um, the bottom left is a, um, um, a, a, a flower and buckeye. And you can see that both of these trees, along, both of these plants, along with many, many others, produce stolons. And the stolons are, again, are what? They're above ground stems that will root along those stems to produce new shoots and eventually new plants. The mother plant in a herbaceous plant, stolen producing plant um, will continue to grow um, as it ages. It produces these daughter plants at the ends of stolons that can be divided. Um, and eventually as the mother plant ages uh, and becomes less productive or less beautiful, these daughter plants will replace it um, in the area in which it's grown. This is certainly true of strawberries. And here is a picture of a strawberry plant that we have growing, several plants actually growing in a pot. And it's a little confusing to see, but, but um, I am holding one of the, the plants, the daughter plants that have rooted in the ground, in the gravel right here. Pulled it up and it's holding it right here to show you. Cleaned out, this is what it looks like on the right side here. The daughter plant 
has its very own root system. And in commercial production, the strawberry daughter plants are the ones that are saved for next year's fruit production, while the mother plant is discarded because simply by virtue of its age, it is less productive than the daughter plants are going to be. Something to think about. Um, stolons, again, are, are one of the reasons why some of our weeds are very, very successful. Um, the bottom right picture shows Bermuda grass, um, which propagates and spreads itself by both stolons, which are above ground, and rhizomes that are below ground. Um, this is one weed that we have a terrible problem with because it is so very prolific and so very successful. It also what makes it a good lawn grass. All right. Um, the, in roses, um, the mother plant in a rose will produce stolons, um, which will sometimes be buried underneath mulch, but oftentimes those stolons will then produce shoots, okay? And those shoots can be pushed to produce a new daughter plant that you can then propagate from, you know, propagate that plant with. Keep in mind that with roses, many of our ornamental roses are grafted. And many of the stolons that come off of a rose plant are coming from the rootstock, which means that the grafted part on the top, which is what we are primarily interested in producing flowers with in most cases, is not the same as the plant that is producing those stolen, those new shoots. Okay, so the plants that are reproduced from a grafted plant, from a stolen that is growing off of a rootstock, is not gonna be the same as the flowering plant that you have, that you know and love. So it's really important with a grafted plant to know where the daughter plant is originating from. And in many cases, that doesn't, in an ungrafted plant, that doesn't make any difference. But in a grafted plant, you need to know where that um, new growth is originated. Here's an example of what I was talking about. Um, on the left, we have a dahlia. Um, this is a, 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 you can see the structure, the, the tuberous root here, all right? This is the growing point right here where the shoots are produced. Uh, if you simply take one of these pieces off and grow it, you simply cut it apart uh, off of the crown, it's not gonna do a single thing. In order for this to grow into a new dahlia plant, you're going to have to have this structure plus a piece of the top, a piece of that growing point at the top, the crown that would produce a new plant. Compare this, however, to a, a regular potato. And a regular potato is, is, is a, a modified stem which has growing nodes, eyes, embedded in the tuberous storage structure. This is, this is, why, this is the difference between the, um, the tuberous root and the tuberous stem. If you cut the stem up and propagate a potato, you can produce a new potato that will grow from these eyes. Okay, and if you are doing that, you need to make sure that you have, again, more than one eye, but one will do it, but three eyes will be better and um, will produce a stronger plant. So the difference is you have to have, with this one, you have to, with the dahlia, you're gonna have to have this, this piece of the root, but you're also gonna have to have, you're gonna have to divide the crown, okay? With this one, all you have to do is cut up the stem. Okay, let's talk about offsets for a minute. Um, this is a, um, an aloe plant. Uh, house plant. Um, this is the mother plant right here. Okay, the mother plant, which has produced offsets at the base. Now I could cut this plant up. I could cut the mother plant up and root sections of the stem, and it would do that. But look at all the babies I've got just from this one piece growing in a pot this summer. Okay, each one of these um, has been repotted and eventually, in very short order actually, I should say, I will have a new aloe plant that is as big as this one right here. All right, this is only about um, 
I've been guessing this is this was an offset itself last year, and I don't I don't do anything special to my plants, and and uh, if they survive, that's great. If they don't, they don't. But anyway, this is the, this is what happens when I took it out of the pot. I took them all very carefully apart, and you notice that each single one of these has got some roots to them that will will grow. Plants are amazing, and they produce very um, different forms of asexual reproductive um, structures. This is the mother of millions plant, the Karen Coe, that produces the little plantlets at the leaf um, edges. And you can see the little plantlets eventually grow their own roots. And those plantlets fall down on the ground and produce a new plant. And this mother plant that this leaf came off of, as it ages, is replaced by these little plantlets. Okay, here's Tomia manesia, piggyback plant, which has a very unusual um, tendency to produce a plantlet right where the stem of the leaf joins the leaf blade. That little plantlet will, will grow spontaneously and you can simply cut the leaf off, root that little plantlet, and you will have a new plant there. Egyptian walking onion, um, now is the time if you have these to break those bulbs apart um, and save them if you wish to or, or replant them for next year. But the stem produces these bulbs at the very top of it. And as the stem gets heavy, it simply bends down and those bulblets come in contact with the soil and begin to grow. Very cool. Here's Turk's cap lily. Um, which produces little, and, and some of the oriental lilies will do this too. They produce little lily bulbils in the axles of the leaves around the main stem. You can harvest these bulbils when the flower, um, before they fall away. And when they fall away, they will produce a new plant. And you can harvest these and propagate the bulbils into you know, new flowering lilies. It will take you probably three to five years for that bulbil to become a mature flowering plant. So you have to be patient. There's another example of, of offsets. Um, this is, uh, of course, a um, spider plant. Uh, most of us know how the spider plants send out these long shoots. At the end of the long shoots, they, have, uh, they develop plantlets and flowers, uh, and the plantlets then in many cases can be cut off directly off of the stem, repotted into planting mix and grow a new plant out of that. Here's the Karen Coey again with the mother of millions um, with the babies along the stem. And this is, you know, as I showed you earlier, I took some of these leaves off and I just stuck them in water and they rooted. I stuck them in soil and they rooted. I broke them off and threw them in the garden and they rooted. Um, you can cut these up into multiple pieces and they would probably root. So the total potency of this plant is very, very high. And um, the plantlets that it produces um, ensure its survival for multiple generations. Okay, how are we doing on questions? We have quite a few and some about uh, specific plants, if that's okay. Um, I'll try. Can you layer mountain laurel? I'm sorry, one more time. Can you layer mountain laurel to propagate it? Can you use layering? For what plant? A mountain laurel. Oh, mountain laurel. Um, certainly you can, yes. Um, you might try air layering too. Because it is a woody plant, you can, and it's gonna be hard to, to, take, those, to take those pieces down to the ground uh, but if you have a branch near the ground, yes, absolutely, certainly. Um, do the same process that I showed you with the azalea plant. Okay. How long does layering usually take? Uh, depends on the plant. Um, um, you can hasten the process along with the wounding, but sometimes it occurs naturally when the, when the branch is in contact with the ground. Um, I would say that if you were to do this in the springtime, uh, first thing in the springtime and combine it, or even in the fall, and combine it with, um, with a little wounding, you would uh, make sure that that 
ground stays in contact with the soil and stays moist, you would have a, a, um, a, a reproducible plant you know, within one season. Okay, that's great. Um, one, one person has a daughter ajugas growing up a wall and wants to know what to, how to handle that. Ajugas? Yeah, ajugas, daughter ajugas. Like, like the ground cover ajuga? Yes. Um, I'm not familiar with it growing up a wall. Yeah. But if, it's, if it's growing in a stone wall, maybe. Yeah, um, brick wall. Um, you want to propagate them or you want to get rid of them? <laughs> well, I don't know. I guess. Uh, could you answer it both ways? <laughs> <laughs> um, um, ajuga. Um, some people love it. Some people hate it. You know, I, that's why I'm, I'm sort of, sort of asking her. Um, a juga sends out sends out those kinds of stolons, and it will reproduce um, readily um, from from contact. It also sends out, you know, underground uh, and offsets and produces offsets. So it's one of those plants that reproduces very readily. Um, I think it can be a very attractive um, little plant. Um, and if you wish to get rid of it, you're going to have to work at removing the um, um, the, the crown of the plant and uh, and keep at it because it will continue to rejuvenate. Okie doke. How do you eliminate rhizomes for invasive plants like Chinese lantern? Um, each of these plants, especially the invasive plants, have got protocols that are very effective for for their removal. Um, for some things like um, like English ivy, you can generally, with a couple of seasons worth of work, you can remove the the um, the above ground structures and um, uproot some of the below ground structures. And if you continue to work at it, you will be able to be successful at eradicating it. And as it has been done by very successfully by many volunteers in, in Arlington and Alexandria who have worked in our public spaces to get rid of English ivy. Um, bamboo um, is another question that I get quite frequently about how to get rid of that plant. Um, and bamboo, uh, unless you have access to heavy equipment to remove the, the root structures um, from the ground, you will have to treat, repeatedly treat the cut surface with a non-selective herbicide um, to be able to um, begin to control it. And again, it is not an easy task and you have to repeat it. For Chinese lantern, um, um, if you are persistent and you can dig it out, that would be effective. Um, you can also try limited and very controlled applications of herbicide, which will help remove it. Okay. What is the best way to um, propagate rosemary? Rosemary. Um, I've seen people be very successful with springtime cuttings of rose of new growth um, on the rosemary, um, where the cuttings are made. Dip it in your rooting hormone, stick it in the soil, put it in the shade. Um, when you're making cuttings of shrub shrub material, typically you don't want to necessarily um, um, take that inside. Just leave it outside, put it in the shade somewhere um, where you can check on the moisture level of the rooting compound, the, 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 the soil that it's growing in, and um, continue to monitor it. Okay. But the rosemary will be, will be is, is fairly easy to make cuttings of in the springtime when it first starts growing. Okay. How about propagating lantana? Oh, lantana is... Um, it's often sold as an annual, but it will become woody. Um, it, is an, it is an annual here. It doesn't, it, uh, to my knowledge, it doesn't, has not successfully survived the winter time here. So um, propagation of lantana for the purpose of restocking your garden in the following year is a possibility because you could take cuttings, um, again, ideally of the ends of the, of the branches and put them, treat them with rooting hormone, stick them in a pot and, um, Overwinter them in a in a uh, in, in your, inside your home. Okay. Another person asked questions about propagating Monarda, Penstemon, and Flax. Um. Okay. Um. 
all of those um, should be readily um, reproducible simply by doing crown division. Okay, you, in the springtime when they first start coming up um, and before they have, you know, gotten too tall, um, you simply dig up the entire clump, divide it the same way that I divided the hosta, three to five eyes per clump, put them into a pot or into the ground again and you'll have a new plant. Okie doke. Best way to propagate silver dollar eucalyptus? Silver dollar eucalyptus, how big is it? Is it a tree? Is it a... Yes, it's um, a tree. Okay. Um, I think that I would want to try, and I also assume it's a house plant, right? Doesn't say. Okay. Um, I think I would try air layering on it. Um, okay. The process with the spider moss and the uh, plastic wrap. It's outdoors. Silver dollar eucalyptus, huh? Well, yeah. then, I, then try layering. If you, can get, if you can bring a stem down to the ground or, or simply place a stem in contact with some rooting medium, then I would, I would try layering. Okay. Um, someone asked about garlic scapes. Um, the bud end, can you uh, plant them and have them grow into more garlic? Um, what we typically advise people to do who want to grow garlic is to purchase, um, and you can purchase it from an organic grocery store, um, a, 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 a head of garlic, break those um, garlic heads away, and you can grow each single one of those um, cloves into a new plant. Um, typically, um, um, garlic planting is done in the fall of the year and over winter and it's allowed to come up and, and then it, it over winter and harvested in, in summer, in June. Okie doke. And when is the best time to divide irises? Irises should be divided right after they bloom. Okay. Dig up the entire clump, cut back the flowering heads and um, uh, per the picture, you know, divide them up, clean them up. It's also a great opportunity to discard those irises, um, the iris rhizomes that have been, that are rotten or shriveled or infested with, with um, iris borers. Okay, and you did say cut off the flower, correct? Yes. Okay, uh, that's it for the questions right now. All right, let's go on here. Um, the rooting process, um, um, just a reminder, what's happening here is that the, the wound that you are creating and making a cutting it's going to develop callus tissue. And that callus tissue, um, um, the process of developing that is different, whether it's a woody plant or an herbaceous plant. Um, and the, the, the callus formation allows it to begin that differentiation of root growth for the, for the purposes of, of growing roots. So, it takes, sometimes it takes time, and this is especially true if you're making woody cuttings. Um, you have to allow that callus tissue to develop, and that callus tissue is where the new growth will initiate um, as the roots begin to grow. Um, here we have um, um, a, a, a reminder that wounding um, a cutting will help that callus development and it will also expose the cambium level, which is right below the bark of woody plants, to the rooting hormone and to the soil and water that will stimulate that growth of adventitious roots. Um, the hormones that we use for dipping um, um, plants into, cuttings into, in order to start the roots is often a mix of auxins, uh, antifungal compounds, and it is it chemically, assist the plant in um, stimulating the production of roots. Um, if you choose to use a plant hormone um, that comes in both a powder as well as a liquid form, and uh, you don't need much of it, okay? And what you have to be aware of, however, is that once you dip your stem into the liquid or the powder, when you insert it into your um, your rooting medium, you know, your potting mix or something like that, you need to make sure that all that material isn't just rubbed off, 
okay? And so what we encourage people to do is to make, an, to insert a pencil or some other kind of tool into the reading medium to make a hole for the cutting to go into. And once you've inserted the cutting into that little bit of hole, push the soil back around it very gently so that the rooting hormone still stays in contact with the stem. Okay, so once you, when you want to water it carefully, um, you want to make sure that it never dries out, okay? Um, pinch the hole around the cutting to seal the hole, water, the, water them in lightly, and maintain that moisture level um, as long as you can. Um, you don't want to use garden soil. Okay, garden soil is typically very heavy in clay. Um, it will not retain the kind of um, drainage qualities that we need. And there's lots of different kinds of potting mixes that are available. Or you can make your own, but typically a mix of peat moss, pine bark, perlite, vermiculite, that will retain moisture while making sure that it drains readily through um, when you water it. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm talking too much too fast. Okay. Um, you don't need fertilizer. You don't need fertilizer. Um, if you are uh, rooting cuttings, um, probably the best thing to do is to, once you have rooted that cutting and maybe transplanted that into its new location, then possibly a, a, um, a half rate of fertilizer, liquid fertilizer, um, would be advent advantageous. But essentially, you can do this in any kind of container that is free draining. Sometimes the container, um, it, the, the rooting is optimized by providing humidity. And some of these containers actually have a built-in lid um, that can help retain moisture. Um, the humidity is important to prevent the top of the plant from drying out. And sometimes um, rooting is also um, enhanced through um, the, uh, uh, using a, a, a heat map. The bottom picture shows a seedling heat map for seedlings. But this can also be helpful sometimes with um, um, cuttings. I once had a Daphne plant I wanted to propagate, and I could not get it to propagate. I, I, everything I tried didn't work, but the root would just rot. And um, I eventually asked a friend of mine who, was, who worked in the greenhouse to take some of my cuttings and put them underneath um, a misting table. And so that constant humidity plus the free draining material that never stayed soggy resulted in very highly excellent um, rooting rates. So the humidity, you can put a plastic bag over it, you can simply stick a jar over it while it's rooting, making sure not to allow sunlight to get to it. You also can take a laundry basket, put your cuttings down in the rooting medium that's down inside the laundry basket and simply cover the laundry basket with a plastic bag. It's a really great way to do that too. Um, once root growth begins, you will be able to see new top growth um, being initiated. And once you initiate, the new top growth initiates, you want to make sure to reduce the humidity. Okay, take the cover away, um, put some, some air circulation if you're growing them inside, um, and um, increase your light levels. Those will optimize top growth at that point. Make sure that your plants never become soggy. Okay, seriously. This is a very um, important point because that constant, um, uh, the lack of oxygen will lead to root decay and root rot. And uh, you don't want it to dry out, but you also don't want it to um, be, um, to not have oxygen there. You can maintain 60 to 75 degrees. That's usually the best. Um, you can, that's air temperature, soil temperature, yes. Um, after you're rooting, after it starts to root, you can lower the temperature down and that will help produce um, better top growth that's, that's more, um, that's, that's uh, increased the light in order to produce, um, to reduce the legginess of growing inside. Fans and of course, Direct light that's very close to your new growth will be helpful. 
Um, all I want to say about light is that if you are growing plants indoors, um, you're going to have to do as good a job as you possibly can at replicating natural sunlight. Natural sunlight has multiple um, um, spectrums of light, and one of the great ways, cheapest ways to replicate that other than buying a, um, an expensive um, fluorescent daylight bulb is to mix a cool bulb with a warm bulb that will give you the most the widest spectrum of light that you can possibly achieve. And of course, if you become serious about it, you're gonna to want to do more than that, but make sure that the light bulbs never exceed a six inch distance from your new plants. When you're transplanting your new cuttings, you want to transplant into a small container. Um, do not transplant uh, little tiny roots into a big giant pot. Um, the, big giant pot and the soil there will hold more moisture than the small plant can deal with. And so it's far better to start with a small pot and then move your way up to a larger pot. If you use um, fertilizer, again, you can use a half strength fertilizer that will avoid burning the baby roots. And uh, make sure that if you are growing indoors or in the shade, you're going to have to harden them off, not only for temperature, but also for light exposure. Um, sunburn is a very real thing on plants, and so you have to be careful. Um, we had a um, um, aglaonema, common house plant, that we were growing indoors, and we put it outside for some sunlight. And um, at the end of the day, it had sunburned leaves because it's not used to that intensity of light. Okay. Um, we're going to talk about um, woody cuttings next, just very briefly, and some, some, some um, bulb chipping and scooping and scoring. The picture here is of a banana plant that I got in the springtime that was about a foot tall. And I stuck it in the ground here. It is now about three feet tall. Very beautifully happy. And um, um, these pups, as they're called, are offsets from the mother plant that can be separated um, with a shovel and rooted very easily. Colleen, are there any questions that we want to move on? There is one small question about Turk's cap and whether the bulbets, if they dry out, will still grow. No, you don't want to let them dry out. Okay. Bulbos that are produced are fleshy. They do not have a hard seed coat and they are designed in nature to simply mature and fall off the plant onto the ground and root right there by the plant. So if you harvest those, you need to immediately plant them into some kind of a, a rooting hormone, rooting, rooting material. Okay, thank you. And um, someone is interested in propagating elder tree. Anything in particular for that? Elder trees, elders, elderberry, I think we're talking about is a shrub. Um, that grows as a thicket, doesn't it? Yes. And so um, as those new shoots come out from the base, you can sometimes identify one that will be um, 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 separatable. You know, if, if, it, if, it's, if it comes off of the, if it's not coming from the other plant, if it comes out as a, as a rhizome or as a root um, um, offset, you can separate that um, and, and by severing the root that goes to the plant and then digging up the plant you know, a couple months later. You can also do cuttings of the ends of the branches in order to propagate those. And the time to do that would be in the springtime when it first starts growing. Okay, that's it for questions for now. Okay, um, let's talk about hard woody cuttings. I can't tell you how many times I've taught pruning class and thought, Oh man, I should be saving these things, okay? Um, because many woody plants are, are, are easily grown from tip cuttings, which is typically what we're producing when we're pruning plants. Um, woody cuttings can be divided into softwood, semi-hardwood, or hardwood type of cuttings. And they can further be divided by the type of cut that you make. Um, there's three types of hardwood cuttings there. Um, straight on the left, uh, mallet, type cutting um, and a heel cutting. And these different types of cuttings will vary um, according to the kind of plant you're trying to reproduce. Now, 
how do you know which which method to use and when to cut it? Well, it's not it's it's not guesswork. Okay, there are recipe books for doing this kind of thing. Softwood cuttings again are done um, on fresh new growth, uh, typically almost as soon as it grows up until the time it turns um, harder. Um, semi hardwood is done from July to September on new growth. Hardwood cuttings, by contrast, are done in dormant season. Uh, they're done of current year's growth, uh, done in late fall, and you can take them all the way to early spring when you can start them. Many hardwood cuttings require um, some kind of stratification to develop that callus tissue. And this particular handout right here from North Carolina State University is very, very um, informative. Here's an excerpt from it where it talks about um, the optimizing the, um, uh, the style of cutting for various different kinds of plants. So you can see here for arborvitae, arborvitae is a common evergreen plant. And if you wanted to reproduce it by cuttings, you should try a, um, a semi-hardwood or a hardwood cutting. Now remember, semi-hardwood is gonna be something we do in the summer. A hardwood cutting is done in dormant season. Here we have um, camellia, softwood, semi-hardwood, hardwood. You can try them all, okay? And the, the publication then also goes into detail about um, the type of cutting, that you, the, the style of cutting that you need to make in order to be successful and how you should try to do that. So if this is something that interests you, I encourage you to um, learn about your specific plant. Now, at the end of this presentation, I have some books um, that you can consult. Um, and of course, if, these days, if you simply put root and camellia into your root and box word, into your um, Google search engine, you will be able to come up with lots of information about the preferred methods of doing that. One of the ways that you can um, get good quality information by doing Google searches is to type your search topic, say boxwood propagation, follow that with the word site, S-I-T-U, and then a colon, and E-D-U. Boxwood propagation, camellia propagation, camellia cutting, site, colon, E-D-U. Google is set up so that they will only return to you those sources of information that are dot from a dot edu source. So you're going to get um, information that comes from a research-based source that is hopefully um, um, and generally um, more informative and more dependable and more correct than what we sometimes find in other sources on the internet. So try that. Okay, root cuttings are taken from two, two to three year old plants. You can't do this on every plant. Um, what the root has in it is a carbohydrate supply. And that root can be laid down uh, horizontally or planted standing up. Uh, it's a very slow process to get a new start. But there are many plants that this will work on. Many of our favorite garden plants will respond very readily to root cuttings. And if you are dividing the crown and you have these leftover root pieces, why not try them? But the crown cutting is going to be much more, uh, more uh, it will produce a new plant much more quickly than doing a root cutting. But if you've got leftover pieces, don't throw them away, try to root them, okay? All right, daffodils chipping, um, kind of a fun little thing to try sometime. I'm losing my voice here. You can take a daffodil ball, up here in the upper left, it typically has a, some, some, some dried out roots at the base, plus it's growing point. And remember, this is a plant that has a flower bud inside a collection of, of leaves. So what you're going to do is you're going to trim, trim away the top and the, and, the, and the roots slightly. Cut off the top, just the top you can see right here. And you're going to trim away the roots a little bit and you're going to expose that, that plate, that basal plate that's at the bottom of the bulb. You can't see it on here so much, and that's why you're pulling away the, the other roots. And then you're gonna start cutting. And you cut longitudinally through the top of the, of the bulb. And you can see this cut right here has the, 
flower bud structure in the center here. <coughs> and you can keep on cutting until you have, you can, you can cut until you run out of pieces that have a base plate attachment. Each piece, each longitudinal split must have a piece of this base in order for this to work. Okay, soak it in a fungicide for 15 minutes, put it in storage for 12 weeks in vermiculite in a, cold, in a, in a plastic bag. Uh, refrigerator works fine, that's about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? Put it in a refrigerator and um, at 12 weeks, you should begin to see um, um, new bulbs forming and you can simply then take them out and replant them. Scooping um, and notching of bulbs that have base plates can also be attempted. And for those of you who are horticulture geeks, you can try this, okay? So you scoop out the base of the bulb with a spoon or a, um, a they, they actually sell tools on the internet for doing this. Um, and um, you plant the bulb essentially upside down in a, in a, a tub, a, you know, a plant, a container of vermiculite or sand. This is a very slow process. It's going to take three to five years to get new flowers. But what eventually happens is that all these little bulbils are produced on and from the cut edges of the bulb. Humidity is important. The cool storage is also very important. So this is produced. You simply break those away and grow those on to a new plant. The only way you would want to do this is if you had a particular variety of bulb that was, that was unattainable and you couldn't do this. You can get the same result um, by doing a cross-hatched cutting like this. You can see the, the uh, edge of the base plate right here, which is where the new growth is going to, the new bulbs are gonna start to form from. Okay. Scaling is a process that can be done with lilies, and you want to, to dig the bulb, clean it off, <clears throat> and each one of those leaves will eventually produce a new tiny bulb if it has a piece of that base plate attached to it. Dip it in antifungal powder um, so that it doesn't rot so badly. Three months in a warm place and another six weeks in the refrigerator. And that they will form little tiny bulbs at the base of the plate. Okay. Hey, okay. We've got um, some reference manuals that you can use. There's some really good ones. This is Michael Durr's on the left side, D-I-R-R. Um, this is the reference manual to woody plant propagation. So if you're interested in making cuttings from your woody plants, this is a recipe book, okay? It'll tell you. If you want to produce new Akuba plants, it's gonna tell you exactly how best to be successful at this. The Bulb Culture Guide that's produced, um, 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 written by Jim Now, is also very effective, and, and all of these books are available on, on um, Amazon. Um, textbooks on plant propagation um, can be a little dense sometimes, but I find um, the um, Peter Thompson's book on, on creative propagation also to be very uh, practical and you can um, um, find those recipes in there also. If you wanna propagate a birria, this is the best way to do it. Finally, I want to say to you that um, we are normally, uh, normally uh, our offices are located in the Farrington Community Center we, have, we are still not back in our offices because of COVID-19, uh, but they, um, um, we are going strong. Weekly public education classes are going on. The Glen Collin Library um, Herb Garden, which is pictured here, is one of five demonstration gardens which are open to the public, and they're just beautiful right now. So if you do nothing else this weekend, if you're in town, go to the mgnv.org website down here. You can see this jot down the locations of the gardens and go on a tour because they're just so beautiful right now. Um, we have had a free seed giveaway um, as we have had uh, for the last, uh, my gosh, close to eight years or so. Um, we have given away 12,000 estimated seed packets this year to 
people and we are now out. So if you, if you, if you can't get your seeds now, if you heard about that, um, we have shut it down because we are out of seeds. Um, soil testing kits are available to you both through the, at the back of the Farrington Community Center as well as at the Green Street Garden Center. And soil testing is a great thing to do this time of year. Um, I also want to um, give you a little bit of a public service message here to say that we um, have just this week, uh, this, this week confirmed uh, a new invasive scale insect on crepe myrtle scale, which has been working its way northwards from the uh, Tidewater area for quite some time. Um, but it, it, was, it did occur on a sample, confirmed a sample from Alexandria. We also have confirmed um, unofficially a sample of jumping, Asian jumping worms, um, which I, I should put a video on sometime, but I don't have it ready for you. Um, this is an, an invasive um, earthworm, which is dangerous only to our, our natural areas because it consumes way more organic matter than, um, than it allows the trees to replace. So I'm going to put this up here just to show you a lovely poem that is one of my favorites that I found in preparation for this class and say to you that um, when you contemplate plant propagation you are um, doing something wonderful for the world and, and um, I, I, I thank you for that. Colleen are there any last questions? There are just two last questions. One is the best way to propagate figs. Ah, propagation of figs can be done with um, stem cuttings. Um, I, I was presented with stem cuttings that were done last two years ago. Um, the gentleman took um, dormant season cuttings and scored them with, um, by running a knife down the sides of the stem and um, stuck them in, um, in, in potting mix and kept them moist and they rooted very readily. Okay. If you uh, want to be ultimately successful, the best success you're going to have is going to be cuttings of dormant wood made um, in early spring when growth is just starting. Okay. And another question about which plants use the scooping and notching technique? Um, scooping and notching technique is a technique for bulbs only. Bulbs. Okay. Thank you, Kirsten. And someone else mentioned that um, they would like us to consider a talk like this on native Virginia plants. That would be fine. Um, we, um, many of the principles are still the same. And um, we, you can apply any plant that produces a clump, um, native flax, um, coneflower, um, Black-eyed Susans, they are clump-forming plants that can be produced exactly the same way we just talked about by dividing the clump in the springtime. Um, <coughs> so yes, it, 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 we, we could do that. Okay, uh, that's it on the questions. Thank you. Wow, okay. <laughs> Great. Thank you all for coming and thank you, Colleen, for helping out today. You're very welcome. I enjoyed it and learned a lot. <laughs> all right. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Yeah, bye-bye.